Good evening, colleagues. We're going to take a look at a very interesting and useful article that was published by Radiographics uh, about the fundamentals of quantification in cardiac MRI. This presentation was um, used by um, the the presenting doctor uh, from a presentation published online and then adapted with some additional illustrations and so forth. So some information about the credits about the article. Here we go. Two institutions, one in Chicago, Illinois, the Northwestern University, and then the University Hospitals of Cleveland uh, Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio, were the ones, uh, the two centers responsible for um, the research behind this article. <clears throat> Some abbreviations that we'll be using are listed here. Um, many of them are, are pretty well known, but yeah, just to keep a few of them in, in, in mind. BSSF is uh, referring to balanced, steady, straight, free precession. All of this will be de um, defined and covered later. Um, then we have uh, GRE, which is gradient echo, RVOT, RVOT, which is right ventricular outflow tract, uh, the same for LVOT and so forth. Um, so some of the selected formulas uh, that they're covering, <clears throat> they'll be explained a bit later, but stroke volume is uh, simply um, the volume of blood pumped from the ventricle per beat. So it's calculated by, multi uh, by subtracting um, the, um, the end systolic volume from the end diastolic volume. The difference, of course, will give us the, the single stroke volume. The ejection fraction is dividing the um, end diastolic volume minus the end systolic uh, volume by the end diastolic volume, which is the same as the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume. Reasoning through this, of course, uh, this is just a brief review, but all of these make perfect sense. And the same with the cardiac output is the heart rate times the stroke volume. So for each stroke volume, if you multiply that by the heart rate, that's, as you remember very well, what we will call the cardiac output later, which is uh, measured in liters per minute. Then you have the regurgitant uh, uh, fraction, which is uh, dividing the regurgitant uh, volume over the forward volume. Um, which is measured in percentages. And then you have the shunt fraction between the pulmonary and the uh, systemic um, flow, which we'll look at later as well. So the learning obje objectives of this article is to understand the basic principles of sequences commonly used in quantitative cardiac MRI and to understand the principles of parameter quantification in clinical scenarios. Um, and to understand and identify common pitfalls at cardiac MRI and learn appropriate troubleshooting techniques. It's a very good uh, article in the sense that it's introducing many basic concepts uh, referred to in, in the multi-parametric cardiac MRI. So a bit of the background is that the cardiac MRI is considered the standard uh, non-invasive modality for providing many structural and functional parameters the quantitative information obtained at cardiac MRI has a significant impact on both diagnosis, treatment, and prognostication of many cardiovascular diseases. So, interpreting physicians must be familiar with basic quantification techniques to ensure the accuracy and reliability of these results. So, a bit of the outline, this is like the summary of the whole uh, topic actually. We'll be looking at um, the measurement of uh, ventricular volumes and function, um, which here they're referring to the steady state free precession imaging, which is an example given here. Some of the parameters that are measured are enlisted here. 
for example, the cardiac output and the ejection fraction, stroke volume, etc., they're measured here. <clears throat> also, the um, end systolic and end diastolic volumes. Here, when we talk about quantification of blood flow, it's a more dynamic measurement. This is using what's called velocity encoded phase contrast imaging. Very interesting, and we'll look at that as well. This allows measuring the peak velocity, pressure gradient, and many other very fascinating concepts. So there you have at last the quantitative uh, myocardial um, tissue characterization, which is using the multi-parametric mapping, um, either in black and white or grayscale, or color-coded uh, images. Um, we have been looking at a few articles lately that uh, cover topics um, that refer to the multi-parametric mapping of, of the heart uh, tissue in several times. So this is an interesting re review and uh, looking at the basic concepts behind uh, what makes it possible to, to, to analyze um, many traits about the cardiac um, tissue itself. So basically here they're using uh, extracellular volume, native and post-contrast T1 sequences, T2 and T2 star um, sequences. So now we're going to uh, plunge right into the topic itself. Talking about the balanced steady state free possession imaging, it's a, a rapid sequence that uses very short repetition times. And basically it's measuring uh, in a single breath hold multiple heartbeats. And what this uh, sequence does is that it, it maintains um, a steady residual transverse magnetization uh, between the successive cycles. So it's that's why it's called steady state. It's something that gives you very um, stable images. They are we can um, compare successive images to each other because they're done in the same breath hold. Um, and between the cardiac cycles, as I mentioned, the, the transverse magnetization uh, field is maintained. Um, so some of the good advantages is the improved temporal resolution, as I mentioned. You have more precise determination of end systole and diastole. Um, <clears throat> This makes sense because you have all the images in the same uh, breath hold. So this um, this gives also more precise mass and volume cal calculations as well because you don't have uh, variations as of you have you would have if you have different moments during uh, the breathing cycle you would have different uh, variations in volume that you would not want to have. So this is a very ideal um, modality for uh, measuring volume and uh, characteristics of the cardiac tissues. So then you have also uh, the bright blood imaging sequences, um, which uh, is weighing proportional to T2 or T1. Uh, this is not optimized for tissue characterization. Um, this balanced steady straight free precession imaging can be performed before or after control, uh, contrast material has been injected. Um, so what they're stating is that you know any pathological uh, myocardial enhancement may be seen. Um, so even if you do the examination after injecting the contrast material where the blood pool itself will have an increased signal. So still they're stressing that yeah, the myocardial enhancement can be seen. Um, so one of the setbacks to this sequence is that you have some artifacts that are more pronounced at uh, uh, a three Tesla MRI. Um, some are like off resonance and susceptibility, which can be used um, for diagnosing purposes. But here, yeah, they mention it as an artifact still. And also the chemical, um, the chemical shift which, um, as, as you all know, is um, referred to the differences between fat and water. So there you get also another set of, of um, artifacts that you don't desire. But these artifacts, they can be overcome with the use of um, the GRE sequences. So that's something worth keeping in mind.
so ventricular volume and function um, are used uh, are measured using a short axis uh, steady state free position image. Um, so um, this is covering the entire uh, image of the of the heart, the entire ventricles from the base to the apex, and um, it also has been very useful in analyzing analyzing congenital heart diseases, um, where you have a, a complete view, as I mentioned, of the whole heart with the four chambers included, um, <clears throat> where. You have an analysis of um, the left and right ventricles. Um, these um, this advantage is is um, <clears throat> found in the analysis of the ventricular volume and function of the uh, state um, steady state free precession images, because they this analysis can be drawn from the same set of images. So. Before quantification is made, uh, it's important that we ensure an adequate coverage of the ventricles, that uh, the whole volume is covered, and also evaluate the presence or absence of artifacts, like motion artifact and susceptibility artifacts as well, which can be because of many different causes. As you know, this, uh, the susceptibility um, can be because of metallic uh, objects in general, light rate and, and others. Um, classifications and, and so forth. So um, this is an animated uh, representation here of, of a short um, axis balanced steady state free precession image uh, midsection. And basically, this, the first step is to de determine uh, the end systolic and end diastolic phases. So um, here, like they're correlating this with the uh, ECG. Uh, here at your left, you can see uh, a short axis image in the end diastole phase, where you have the blood pool in the right ventricle and the left ventricle, respectively. Um, so you can have different phases of the right and left ventricles at, at any given point of time. Um, so this is why they're stressing the need of multiple sections to determine the, you know, the end diastole and end systole phases in both the re, uh, right and left ventricle. So here the same here, you have a short axis end systolic uh, phase image where you clearly have a, a um, reduced volume of the, of the blood. Um, here the second step would be like making a contour. Um, First here, the yellow line is of the endocardial uh, line, and then you have the, uh, yeah, of the right ventricle. The same would be for the left ventricle, the right uh, over here and the left here. The red line would represent the, the contour uh, of the left ventricle endocardium. And the green line would be the epicardial um, contour. Um, so this is measured at different points. Uh, and this is necessary for the mass calculations um, <clears throat> and for determining volume uh, of, of the ventricles of the mass itself, of the tissue. So tips are um, that when you're measuring the, the basal section, uh, the myocardium needs to surround at least 50% of the blood volume. Uh, we'll see an example where that's not um, the case. And uh, some other points briefly covering the, the essentials is that we should include the left ventricle outflow tract in the blood volume as well. The same goes for the right ventricle. Uh, we need to include the right ventricle outflow tract. And to keep in mind that the, the contours of the right ventricle may have a more irregular shape, like a comma shape, compared to the left ventricle. A tip when it comes to the measurement of the apical region. Um, well, when the most apical section uh, contains only a circle of myocardium without visible blood pool, an epicardial contour without the endocardial contour should be drawn. So it's like we, we don't do the endocardial contour here, but only the epicardial one when we don't see the, um, the blood pool inside of the ventricle. Um, so sometimes, yeah, what they're mentioning here is that 
it can be very important to use a cross-reference with a long axis view to confirm the location. We'll, we'll see that later. Um, here, exactly here. This is like the long axis reference, and you, so you, you can be sure where you're measuring uh, the short axis view. So this is basically um, a short axis section Im image of the left ventricle, where you're seeing the right ventricle outflow tract here in yellow. Um, here you have um, a, um, an atrial short axis section image showing the aorta, uh, the left atrium, the right uh, atrium, the main pulmonary artery, and the inferior uh, um, vena um, cava. So here there, I mentioned that would, would show like where there is an image of less than 50% of the blood pool surrounded by myocardium. Where you measure, it should be more than that. Um, so again, here, the same lines that I mentioned, the epicardial contour, the endocardial, and here the right ventricle outflow tract. Um, so question arising, you know, should we include or exclude the left ventricle papillary muscles and trabeculations? Um, this, of course, I mean, whether we include them or not affects the volumes and the mass measurements. So, um, I mean, the combined papillary muscles and trabeculations as seen here, they account for almost 30% of the left ventricle mass. So, um, the effects can be exaggerated in, in a highly trabeculated and hypertrophied ventricles. So, the thing is, um, we should state the technique in the report, whether we include or exclude these structures, like all the papillary muscles and the trabeculations. Uh, so the option is left to the interpreter to to choose, uh, but he needs to state he or she needs to state what he or she did. Um, when it comes to the right ventricle, uh, well, routinely the trabeculations are ignored when doing the contour. Different for the vent uh, for the left ventricle, there you there you do have the option of including them or excluding them. Here you see an, a good example of the uh, exclusion. Uh, of the papillary muscles and trabeculations, and here the inclusions um, of, of the same, right, in the volume. Mm -hmm. the, the green, between the green and the red uh, lines, here you have an inclusion of the papillary muscles and trabeculations in um, the volume calculation. So here you have uh, step three, which would be calculating the endocardial and diastolic volume and end systolic volume. So this is like summing up all of the different measurements that have been done uh, through cross-sectional areas with the endocardial contour um, multiplied by the section, section thickness. So here you have uh, a, the computer helping you to, to get the total ventricle or, uh, volume in the end, right? You have the different areas and you, like, by uh, measuring different uh, cross-sections, you end up getting the total volume. So then... Uh, you know, the ventricle volume and function includes calculating the stroke volume, the ejection fraction, and the cardiac output. Uh, we mentioned these initially, these uh, equations. Um, so, I mean, when you don't have a shunt uh, or a significant valvular regurgitation, uh, you should have very similar stroke volumes to the left ventricle and the right ventricle because this is a closed circuit system, remember. So, it, they should be close to the same. This is an example of values um, stated in this table here. Um, so the myocardial thickness, the myocardial thickness is um, something that should be measured, and um, we report measurements in the end diastole. Um, so basically, we measure the myocardial thickness on images obtained in orthogonal or uh, perpendicularly. To the chamber, um, and this is typically made on short uh, axis images. Uh, if we do it on oblique axis through the ventricle, it can overestimate the thickness. So that's very important to keep in mind. Here we have an example of hypertrophic acardiomyopathy, where we have an asymmetric hypertrophy of the basal septum. Here you have 25 millimeters across, and the wall thickness here is 11. So this uh, meets the criteria for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These, this image is uh, from a balanced steady-state free possession image, as you see here, which is good for anatomical detail. 
Um, so the myocardial mass, um, we, we copy the um, end systolic and end diastolic phases and the left ventricle endocardial and epicardial contours uh, from our previous calculations. And uh, for mass calculations, some um, radiologists or, or, uh, or cardiologists, they choose to only draw the epicardial contours in the end diastole only. The left ventricle endocardial and epicardial contours are measured but we can choose whether to do that only in the end diastolic phase or if we do it both in the end uh, systolic and end diastolic. Um, so this will give us added um, value when we do it in both, but we can opt for doing it only in end diastolic phase. So the second step here, um, is where we calculate the end diastolic and end systolic endocardial and epicardial volumes. Um, this well, yeah, they mentioned the Simpson's rule technique, which basically is yeah, a, um, a mathematical tool um, where uh, yeah, it's a numerical analysis for numerical integration. Uh, it's interestingly also used for ship stability. Um, anyway, so. The, the, the volumes are calculated uh, through this technique, this mathematical technique, and uh, well, then you decide to include or exclude the papillary muscles and trabeculations, and basically by, uh, by subtracting the short axis midsection endocardial cross-sectional area from the epicardial cross-sectional area, you end up having the myocardial cross-sectional area here in brown. <clears throat> so then you can calculate the mass by multiplying the myocardial volume by a known specific density, which is referred to here as uh, 1.05 grams per milliliter. The velocity encoded phase contrast imaging is very interesting because you can uh, get dynamic parameters from this. Um, when you use the gradient echo sequence, uh, where you have induced phase shifts in moving protons, you can measure movement, so to speak. Um, just to kind of understand this, this would be like, um, I hope no one gets offended when I say this, but it would be like comparing uh, the Doppler function uh, in, in ultrasound. So, um, although it's represented finally in, in, in static images, of course. Um, so, here you get higher low signal intensity depending on the direction, right? So. Um, the velocity encoding gradient is, is defined as the corresponding to maximal phase shift. And here you get measurement of the peak velocity um, as well. So basically the blood flow is measured uh, through a magnetic field that's applied and the changes of direction and the angles are measured and we can then get an idea of, of the changes in direction and the changes in in um, particle in the in the spatial uh, characteristics of, of the particles. So that's what gives us the sense of movement. Um, here you have in plane and through plane images. Um, basically, in plane depicts the velocity par parallel to the direction of the blood flow, while the through plane is um, orthogonal uh, to the direction of the blood flow, which is the same as perpendicular. Um, so this, this, the last one is necessary for accurate calculation of flow parameters, while the one uh, parallel to the direction of the blood flow, which is the in-plane, measures the peak velocity. Mm -hmm. So this is comparing uh, the uh, left ventricle outflow tract uh, systolic phase, and here uh, this is phase contrast images. So um, in the A and B we have, as I mentioned, the left ventricle outflow tract, um, and uh, here you have uh, below um, the, the images that are corresponding to the through plane systolic phase. Um, what they're emphasizing here is that the anatomy is better delineated on magnitude images than on the phase contrast imaging. So those images are combined to get an end result. So here you have the peak velocity and gradient. Um, basically, we ensure that, as before we, we quantify, we ensure the proper uh, VENC selection. VENC is basically referring to uh, the velocity encoding. Um, 
Um, so if we, this is interesting, when we set it too high, it will call uh, cause aliasing. We'll explain that just now. But this is an example. You have like an aliasing artifact where the frequency of the input information is greater than what we can measure. Um, that's something we see in real life as well. And then we have the bank, uh, if it's set too high, then we can cause low velocities being obscured by the background noise. This is also similar to what happens in ultrasound when you put uh, the limits too high or too low. You can also have a lysing um, when you're using the Doppler function. So, um, well, this is interesting that, you know, you should correct. Uh, usually it's optimal to correct this uh, increasing the VENC and then uh, keeping in mind that most uh, post-processing software packages have algorithms for decreasing the artifact from aliasing. So it's better to go too high than to go too low, so to speak. The aliasing is easier to deal with than the background noise. Um, so another tip is that uh, you can use uh, cost cross-reference with in uh, plane or face, uh, yeah, with in-plane face contrast or the steady state free precision images to ensure the correct plane selection, right? This is the same that we mentioned where we have like a, a long axis view and we can see where we are when we're doing the cross-section image. Um, so the face contrast images may underestimate flows with eccentric jets and helical flow. The helical flow is the one that is like spiral because of turbulence. So that may not be measured accurately. We have mentioned this image uh, referring it as an example of a liasing artifact. Here we have a left ventricle outflow uh, tract view um, of, of the three chambers from a steady state uh, free precession image. Uh, and we have an eccentric regurgitant jet, which is uh, marked by the, uh, by the white arrow. It's directed posteriorly toward the anterior mitral leaflet here. So we're actually seeing here uh, the jet uh, represented by the image. Okay, so I thought this worth including you remember this image that we were analyzing just a couple of minutes ago? Aliasing, just to remember uh, some examples of why this happened. It happens in real life. Um, wagon wheel or effect or stroboscopic effect is when we see a wheel uh, in a video camera, some when we're seeing a movie, and the wheel seems to be going backwards. Uh, this is the same thing because the camera is not having a input frequency enough to to make uh, a faithful representation of, of real life. The same thing happens when you're measuring a low, when your measurement is low frequency, you're missing out many details and you get a sinus wave that's a different frequency than it actually is. Same thing would happen like if you have a clock that you measure it every 45 minutes. So next time it's at nine, then it's at six, then it's at three. And if you take the summary, it seems like it's going backwards. But it's just because you're measuring it uh, with, a low, with a lower frequency than you should to get a faithful image, to get an accurate representation. So that's just to keep in mind what aliasing is all about, which is here represented by this artifact that you get here. That's when you put the vank too high. So um, here you have peak velocity and gradient, which is like measuring... Uh, both with the face and magnitude images into post-processing software, where we're drawing the um, the region of interest on through-plane or in-plane image in which margins of flow are best delineated. So a tip is to draw this uh, interest area uh, on magnitude images because of better anatomy depiction. Um, and we get their velocity and flow data only from the face images. Um, also important to keep in mind. Here you have actual through plane systolic phase and magnitude, um, A and B respectively, phase contrast images above the level of the aortic valve showing the, um, the, the region of interest, which is marked by the red circle, around the aorta. Uh, here you have the left ventricle outflow tract view in, in, uh, in plane systolic phase, image C, and the magnitude in D. Uh, these are phase contrast images as well. They're showing the um, region of interest in, in the red oval around the area of flow in the left ventricle outflow tract and the proximal aorta. So the peak velocity and gradient uh, are measuring the peak velocities for each phase according to this, the phase shift. We mentioned uh, 
that velocities and directions of, of particles moving uh, from from one spatial um, point uh, to another can be measured by these uh, sequences. So um, here they're mentioning that the software background correction may correct inaccuracies due uh, to the presence of phase offsets. So the pressure gradient here is, is calculated uh, using the modified Bernoulli equation. The Bernoulli equation, the simple Bernoulli equations and the modified Bernoulli equations are used in um, echocardiography and I'll, I'll explain in a bit uh, just to review a bit of the physics about that. But these uh, are three images where uh, you have um, yeah, images above the level of the aortic valve, uh, which is is measuring the the peak velocity um, using this phase shift signal. Um, so just remember, this is a, a slide from that I added. The modified Bernoulli equation basically will keep both the end um, or the, yeah, the post orifice and the pre orifice uh, velocities in mind. Uh, what they're mentioning here in a, in a different um, source is that if you have a, a, a velocity, a fluid velocity um, in the beginning of, of the or orifice or the pre-orifice abnormally high, then uh, you should use the full equation. This could be seen in obstructive cardiomyopathy, for example. Uh, normally, they use the simplified one in echocardiography because it's simply... Uh, n there's simply no difference between uh, these two. So just remember the Bernoulli principle. This is basically what Bernoulli, Daniel Bernoulli described by the end of the 18th century um, and what the Wright brothers uh, practiced uh, about a century later uh, that made it possible for them to fly, where you have a, a quicker speed uh, of any fluid or by air you have less uh, static pressure or potential energy. So this here uh, basically means that air has a, um, a lot more pressure when moving slowly here because it's accelerated on top of the uh, wing of an airplane. This makes it possible for the, for the wing to actually lift. And when it comes to fluid dynamics, which is where it was mainly described, but the same principle applies, um, you have a, a, a high velocity of fluid in this uh, in this diameter, where the the pressure will be lower, uh, and yeah, as in the side pressure, the static pressure, which is actually going in each direction, it's not just to the sides. When the fluid is is uh, moving more slowly in this big section here, you have a lot more uh, static pressure or, or potential energy. So this is important to keep in mind when it comes to flow dynamics. Uh, basically, it's like when you drive slowly, you see uh, the scenery much, much easier, <laughs> so to speak. So uh, the peak velocity and gradient, here you have a case example of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, you have three chamber steady, um, balanced steady state free precession image obtained during systole here. Uh, and you can see, clearly see the thickening of, thickening of the basal septum as shown by the solid arrow here and the defacing jet secondary to the flow acceleration across the left ventricle outflow tract, the left ventricle outflow tract, which is by the, um, shown by the dotted arrow. Then you have another image, with, which is a phase contrast image uh, of the left ventricle outflow tract, where, you, uh, where they have shown here the, um, the peak velocity of 2.0 meters per second, um, where the gradient using the modified Bernoulli equation was 16 uh, mercury millimeters. Um, so this is in, in the case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Um, then you have the forward and reverse volumes. Um, measure, yeah, a measurement of the peak velocities is done for each phase where it's plotted over time um, by cross-sectional areas of the region of interest. So you have both the forward or the positive uh, gradient and the reverse, which is the negative flow. We'll show that later. So in the absence of valvular, uh, valvular, valvular uh, regurgitation or shunt, the forward volume should be nearly equal to the stroke volume. This uh, forward volume is represented by the area under 
the flow versus time curve, which is marked here in orange, right? So here you have a neg negative component of the curve, which is a regurgitant volume of 13 milliliters in this case. If you divide the regurgitant volume over the forward volume, there you have the regurgitant fraction. Um, so here you have a uh, case example of our aortic uh, regurgitation. Uh, here you have a steady state free possession image, a balanced uh, steady state free possession image of the three chambers. And here um, um, we're with aortic regurgitation jet, um, which is shown here by the by the arrow, and where in the second image um, you have um, a, a, the region of interest drawn around the sending aorta, uh, the forward volume through this area uh, is the orange shaded area during systole, and a reverse volume in the in the in the other shaded area recorded in this circular area here uh, is during the early diastole. So the calculated regurgitant fraction is 19. Um, this is in the a case of a person with Loyes uh, Diet uh, syndrome where you can get uh, aortic uh, aneurysms, dilatation of the aortic um, <clears throat> structure. So here you have again the forward and reverse volumes uh, in the case of a mitral regurgitation. Um, so here they measure that the mo because of the motion of the atrioventricular valves, as in the uh, tricuspid and the mitral valves, uh, through the cardiac cycle, the direct quantification of the regurgitation with through plane phase contracts is sometimes less uh, reliable. What they do here is they 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 propose um, an indirect method to measure it through uh, through yeah calculating with this formula, which makes sense. You have the mitral regurgitant volume uh, being the left ventricle stroke volume minus the aortic forward flow. And these are parameters that you got from the MRI images, but you simply calculate them instead of seeing them on, on the image because of, as they mentioned, the the motion of the atrioventricular, uh, atrioventricular valves during the, the cardiac cycle. Um, so, yeah, just to keep in mind, if you have aortic regurgitation um, as well, then, of course, you should also subtract the aortic, um, um, the, the regurgitant volume from the aorta from the mitral regurgitant volume to get this, um, this formula corrected. Um, here you have, by the green arrow, uh, <clears throat> shown a regurgitant jet. Uh, in the aortic region, and the regurgitant fraction was 35 percent, uh, 25 milliliters. Um, so the shunt quantification uh, it covers the analysis of intra and extracardiac uh, shunts. Um, so you, ha you can use direct or indirect techniques. Um, basically, the direct is using the phase contrast image, um, and when you evaluate the flow through the shunt. And a tip is is to use a lower uh, vank. Uh, you remember that we could have like too much noise if it's too low, and and if we have it too high, the vank will have a liasing. Well, here they're they're uh, showing the need to to uh, adapt the um, the vank to about 58 to 80 centimeters per uh, second because these flows are naturally slower than by nature. So. Um, yeah, they're they're slower, so we need to to lower the vank to measure it accurately, accurately without uh, any aliasing or uh, artifacts there. Um, so here, when it comes to the indirect technique, uh, the images through the phase contrast uh, sequence, you you're getting them from above the level of the pulmonic and aortic valves, and then you calculate simply the fraction. Uh, whereas you'll have a normal uh, one ratio of the, the pulmonic and aortic forward flows, the pulmonic and aortic forward flows. Um, where you have a left to right shunt, uh, you will have the QP uh, and QS above one. And when you have a right to left shunt, it will be QP over QS less than one. When the this ratio is more than 1.5, usually repair is considered. 
Here you have a case example of partial and anomalous pulmonary venous return, uh, which is seen here in a coronal maximum intensity projection, which is also referred as MIP, MR angiogram. Um, you're seeing here the uh, symmetry uh, vein here, which is basically connecting the pulmonary circulation to the systemic circulation. And uh, through these different uh, images from phase contrast uh, sequence, you get the aortic and the pulmonic uh, through plain phase contrast image, um, where you get then uh, the possibility of calculating the ratio in this case is 1.3. This is confirming the presence of a left to right shunt. Then when you come to parametric mapping, um, which we had mentioned at the beginning, um, this gives us a tremendous advantage of, of getting um, myocardial characterization of edema, fibrosis, interstitial processes. Basically, this was usually a qualitative measurement before, but um, now we have been able to get a more precise uh, means of, of measuring this because of the parametric mapping of the heart tissue. So when we were talking about diffuse myocardial disease uh, before, it usually was more difficult to depict with the, the qualitative um, measurements. So the parametric mapping um, allows, as I said, the quantification of the myocardial parameters you get secondary images, which are maps, uh, where each pixel represents a specific magnetic tissue property. And this is giving uh, us the possibility to, to get qualitative assessment of the tissue. It can be measured directly by T1, T2, or T2 star, or represent derived parameters as in the extracellular volume. So when it comes to T1 mapping and extracellular volume, you you uh, should consider the following, that T1 is the time constant representing the recovery of longitudinal magnetization. This is basic uh, MRI physics, of course. Uh, so you have various methods of calculating the T1 values. Uh, you can perform the pre-contrast, which, which is also referred to as the native um, T1 images, or the post-contrast. And this, these, for example, are used um, in, in later, as we'll show just in a bit. Um, the post-contrast images are obtained uh, 10 to 30 minutes after the injection of contrast material. So most pathologic conditions cause T1 prolongation. Examples are fibrosis, edema, and infiltrative uh, diseases. So when it comes to extracellular volume, we'll talk here in a bit, but measuring T1 times it depends on several factors. Hematocrit is one important factor that we'll discuss in a while. Uh, it's important to have local or scanner-specific reference ranges. Actually, they're, uh, they're saying that um, it's, uh, well, on, in other sources, it's, it's important to note that when we don't have local or scanner-specific reference ranges, we, we shouldn't uh, um, use the information as something that can be um, um, considered a reference. So uh, when you have the extracellular volume, uh, the extracellular volume itself is a marker of myocardial tissue remodeling. So uh, this is something that, yes, is more reproducible, um, whereas this is not. Uh, the, the, um, the T1 times themselves, they're not reproducible unless you have a local or scanner specific reference ranges. Um, so the ECV, will see a, a, an explanation following here, but it's basically calculated from the native and post-contrast blood and myocardial T1 times, normalized, important, normalized to the patient's hematocrit. The normal range, the normal range is 25 plus minus 4%. Here, I just wanted to include this to get this um, clear. Um, well, I entitled this section Extracellular Volume Made Simple. Basically, uh, you, hear, you have here the abbreviations myocardium, blood pool, hematocrit, native, and post-contrast. The extracellular volume can seem a bit confusing, you know, when we think of uh, this um, equation here. Basically, yeah, just trying to make it make sense. Um, this first step here is avoiding false positives when you have a high hematocrit. Uh, 
just think of it, when you have a high hematocrit here, uh, this will bring down this first number. So this, I mean, for example, when you have polycythemia, polycythemia viria, um, you would tend to like get uh, a false positive uh, in the ECV and the extracellular volume to high volume, uh, to high values. So this compensates for that. And when you have anemia, for example, uh, you get a lower uh, hematocrit. Uh, well, this value will be higher. So this will compensate the final measurement of the ECV. So this avoids the false negative in the low, in the low hematocrit patients as in anemia, for example. Then here you have the difference between the post contrast here and the native uh, images. So when this, as in when you subtract this from this, you get the net effect of the enhancement. So like what did the contrast do to my image? This is what you get in both sides here, right? I think you're following me. And here, basically when you have got that, this difference, the net value of the contrast effect, here you divide both. So this is the difference between the myocardial signal and the blood pool. So uh, basically, the blood pool would be like the contrast material that remains in the intravascular space. So that's then getting the net value of extracellular signal, which is what we call extracellular volume. So I hope that made sense and helps to understand this concept more clearly. Back to the last parts of the topic. Um, so here you have uh, the use of three short, ima short three short axis images, base, mid, apex, apex. This is most commonly used to get the map images in grayscale or color using the native and post contrast map. Um, and of course, they need to be free of significant artifact as motion susceptibility uh, and misregistration. Uh, so, we also have to have the hematocrit level within 24 hours uh, to calculate the, the extracellular volume. Here we have a short axis based native T1 map uh, with the the basal in inferoseptum with the solid arrow here and you have a susceptibility artifact here by the bla uh, dashed blue arrow here uh, and then you have uh, another image here which is the four chamber post contrast uh, t1 map with an apparent low t1 uh, value within the septum but this is uh, secondary to motion artifact from an arrhythmia so important to keep in mind that as well to avoid a false positive here you have uh, the fact that maps may be analyzed manually with pros processing software or by drawing the region of interest. Uh, so when using the software, you are using the native and post-contrast T1 times at global section or segmental level. You, you get the contours of both the epicardial and endocardial lines, um, and the regions of interest are placed within uh, blood pool on each level. So then you get the ECV or extracellular volume uh, maps, which is here depicted by the color image, right? Uh, yeah, we don't have to review all this. We have seen this before. This is uh, the, the blood pool is, is here uh, measured in this uh, region of interest. And then you have the endocardial and the, uh, epicardial um, uh, contour, which is basically giving us this uh, extracellular volume map in the end. Um, here's some other things about the uh, region of interest assessment. You have the global diffuse disease, and which is when, when you need to draw the region of interest in the middle basal septum. Uh, it's more uh, uh, appropriate as a representation of these um, global uh, diseases in the, as in the ones that affect the whole heart. When you have focal abnormal abnormalities, it should be drawn in the abnormal segment alone. And uh, it, like all the measurements, the regions of interest should be drawn from the re, uh, from the same regions of myocardium and the blood pool to allow the the, the, the calculation of this uh, of the ECV. Um, so some of the things that we should avoid, like the epicardial fat or fluid and artifacts when drawing the region of interest. And here you have a native T1 map and post contrast map comparing that both values, uh, getting also. Uh, a comparison with the hematocrit, which in, in this case is 0. Point or yeah, point, uh, 47. So you get an ECV, uh, which here is normal, 25%. Here, this is a case of um, amyloidosis, where you have the late gadolinium enhancement, or LGE image here. Uh, 
which demonstrates diffuse patchy mm, myocardial enhance, enhancement here, uh, most pronounced with the mid and apical interventricular septum, uh, within the mid and apical interventricular septum. It is uh, delineated by the red arrows. So here we, we see the mid short axis native T1 map. Basically, just to summarize, you get an elevated native T1 value here, where you have the post contrast image of the same. It's a low value, basically because the contrast uptake is slower in fibrosis and other uh, chronic uh, conditions, including amyloidosis. Uh, so here, the the corresponding e extracellular volume map uh, is generated, and well, the midsection was markedly elevated at 50%, which is consistent with diffuse amyloid infiltration. So the T2 mapping, uh, briefly going some of the going through some of the key concepts here. Uh, you have the time constant representing uh, the decay of transverse magnetization, uh, and this is yeah sensitive to uh, to um, water tissue content or edema in myocardial tissue. Uh, this is applicable to acute myocardial infarction, myocarditis, sarcoidosis, cardiac allograft re uh, rejection, and so forth. Um, these images are uh, obtained in pre-contrast uh, phase and usually at the same locations as the T1 maps. And uh, yeah, usually it's commonly referenced as normal T2 range, 49 to 55 milliseconds in a 1.5 Tesla MRI. So uh, the, the tip that they're giving here is that um, local or scanner-specific reference ranges should be used for the T2 values, as mentioned also for T1. Um, so we should perform the same quality check. We won't go through that in detail. It's already been mentioned, but yeah, the T1 maps have general rules that also apply here. The maps may be analyzed during, uh, may be analyzed using similar regions of interest and post-processing software techniques that have been uh, mentioned. So a tip that they give is that the uh, regional or segmental analysis is more useful as a certain uh, a certain pathological conditions like myocarditis, produce regional areas of myocardial edema. So here we have a base short axis colored T2 map and an apex short axis colored T2 map. Uh, and this is uh, an example of normal T2 mapping. Uh, this is the 16 segments result map provided by the American Heart Association. And this is how to state the topography of the lesion or the abnormal um, findings. So here's another case example where, yeah, to describe the T2 functions. This is acute myocardial infarction. We have a late gadolinium enhancement uh, image here, uh, demonstrating transmural delayed enhancement here uh, with the area of, of uh, microvascular obstruction by the mid septum and an entire apex. So um, this is consistent with infarction uh, when with an associated apical uh, thrombus, which is shown here by the dust arrow, uh, where we're uh, applying stir sequences, uh, we we see increased signal intensity, uh, which uh, is basically um, consistent with myocardial edema. Stir is very uh, sensitive for edema. Then you have the four chamber colored. T2 map, which is showing increased T2 values with an infarcted mid to apical left anterior descending artery territory. Um, so the T2 values are, are, are uh, decreased within the apical thrombus, which is shown here by the, um, by the dashed arrow. Here the colors tend more towards green and around it's more towards the red spectrum. So that red would be like higher and the green and yellow would be uh, lower values. The T2 star mapping uh, is basically, yeah, T2 as in it's a time constant, but it's used in the presence of local field inhomogeneities. Uh, the example of this is the GRE um, sequence, and uh, it's usually used for myocardial iron and hemorrhage uh, measurements. Uh, so the region of interest in the midsection within the septum is used to avoid susceptibility artifact. Um, so some of the ranges here stated is, yeah, T2 star normal range is more than 40 milliseconds for the iron uh, measurements. When it's low risk, the iron measurements would be like 
more than 20 milliseconds and the medium risk is between 10 and 20 and then high risk T to star is below 10 milliseconds for iron overload. This is a patient with hemochromatosis and um, the white contour is placed over the septum and uh, basically the region of interest is, is showing um, the area is, sh is showing a, a lower value than normal which is then giving us the indication that this is probably uh, an iron overload. Here you have uh, another uh, set of images referring to myocardial hemorrhage uh, where the late gadolinium enhancement image here at the left uh, shows extensive delayed enhancement by the solid arrows and this is consistent with infarction with areas of non-enhancement uh, concerning for microvascular obstruction which is shown by the dashed arrow here. This is, uh, yeah, you have non-enhancement of this area. So this is infarction in this case. And the, here you have the native T1 image, uh, an image shorter axis image, where um, basically the, the decreased native T1 uh, uh, areas here in this image um, also is compatible with, with infarcted myocardium here. This here is a mid short axis T2 image uh, showing a normal to slight decreased uh, times with elevated times around it. So this is, yeah, the surrounding myocardium is elevated, but the, the, the regions of interest is, is, is remaining low. So when you combine the decreased native T1 and T2 times, it's very suggestive of hemorrhage. And this is confirmed by the decreased T2 star values, which here is uh, 16 uh, milliseconds. So this is a good uh, sequence, the T2 star mapping, to confirm what uh, is seen here. Um, so yeah, this is concluding now. Some take-home points. The cardiac MRI um, is, is a good uh, tool allowing quantification of myocardial structure and function, velocities and flows, as well as more objective assessment of fibrosis, edema and iron. Although post-processing is becoming uh, more and more an automated uh, process um, with more sophisticated software and, and the use of artificial intelligence and so forth, uh, yeah, it, they stress here that user input is mandatory to ensure an accurate quantification. Interpreting radiologists must be knowledgeable of the basic steps and principles of cardiac quantification and recognize um, and troubleshoot common pitfalls. So, um, basically summarizing and giving my own opinion, I thought this was a very, very useful uh, review on some of the basic concepts involving um, multiparametric MRI uh, imaging of the heart tissues and some of the pathological conditions that, um, that are giving us examples of, of what we can see the potential of this method and some basic principles that we should keep in mind, including some physics um, and uh, and things, characteristics directly related to each and one of the sequences used um, as to, to be familiar with um, this technique and, and as to um, provide a good evaluation that can help clinicians to take uh, good decisions as well. So thank you very much for your attention. This is all for now.